Well, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord in Big Bear Four Square Church. And, you know, next Sunday is Palm Sunday already. Wow. Uh, so we're going to be celebrating Palm Sunday and then uh, getting into the Easter week. You know, the, East, the Holy Week, the Easter week, is the biggest celebration in Christianity for over two billion people, right? And uh, we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord and the essentials of our faith. And really for us, the worship on the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection, we celebrate Easter every week, the resurrection. Well, the message I have for you today is called, Some Will Abandon the Faith. From 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're looking at verse 1 through 11. And as you're turning to there, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for my friends here in the body of Christ. Thank you for the church. Thank you, Lord, for your, the way you speak to us. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint the word today. Your word's already anointed, but help us to be anointed to deliver it, to receive it. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. Holy Spirit is saying clearly that in the last times. You know, um, we have great evidence of the last days, don't we? And with every year that passes, more signs and more things that are evident of the last times. You know, characteristics of the last days are evident in every generation, even from the time of, of Peter saying that in Acts chapter 2, that during his preaching that in the last days, people will be filled with the Spirit. Old men will dream dreams, young men will see visions, they will prophesy and so on. So every generation has seen a taste of what it's going to like to be in the last days. We will see the accumulation of the last days fulfilled in the scripture, whether with our own eyes, but the world will see it sometime. Would it be, would it be all right with you if Jesus interrupted the service by coming right now? Could it be okay? We have to live as if he's coming soon, whether corporately or personally. Amen. He might come for you in a personal visitation right now. And I was at a funeral for a good friend, Pastor Joseph, from uh, Crestline Four Square Church, and 53 years old, went home to be with the Lord. You just don't know. Leaves a young wife and two teenage daughters. And, uh, and I said, the thing I thought about is, Joseph, you cheated us by going early. But listen, our time can come anytime. Age, you go to walk through a cemetery and you find out that every age in that cemetery, if it's been around for a while, is represented there. Every age. Yeah. Sad to go through the baby section. Sad to go through, see occasional teenager and this and that. And then once in a while you see somebody 102 years old go buried there. We never know when the Lord's going to come for us corporately or personally, but we have to be ready 
because the Bible tells us that we are living in last days. And because it says that, we believe it. Amen. James says, don't think that God is putting things off as if he doesn't know what he's talking about or as if he's too slow in fulfilling his promise. For a day to the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So Jesus told these things a couple of days ago. Amen. It's a matter of perspective, isn't Amen. it? It's just a moment of time. Some people abandon the faith. It says clearly in the last days, the Spirit says, some will abandon the faith. Some abandon the faith for good reasons. They're good. They're busy about a lot of good things. They have a lot of good reasons. Their time is filled up. They have a busy life. They got career, and children, and family, and grandparents. They have things going on. They have twenty kids in soccer. Whatever it is, it's a lot of good things happening but so busy that God is not even in, in, in their life. Isn't that a deception? Mm -hmm. It's not that a lot of bad things take you out. It's that you're busy about a lot of good things, There's a lot of wonderful things happening. When Jesus said that it would be like this, like the days of Noah, and interesting, when Jesus said, like the days of Noah in Matthew 24 and Luke 13, Mark 13, Luke 17, around there, you find that in the days of Noah, they were giving in, in marriage, they were having a lot of marriage, weddings. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Good times. They were eating and drinking and and uh, going about life, what's wrong with any of that? In the list of things that Jesus listed, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, except for they were too busy for God. They were living as if God did not exist, going by, by uh, about their business and things like that. Uh, like in the days of Lot, you know, you would think that Jesus would condemn the uh, sexual activity in Sodom and Gomorrah in his description, but he says they were planting and reaping and they were doing other things, and meaning that they were so busy about their life that God did not exist. I think that uh, puts a lot of Christians to sleep. They have the confession of faith. They love Jesus and know Jesus, but they live in, like they're atheists, and they never pray, never seek God, never go about looking for the things of the Lord. And pretty soon they become at ease. And then COVID comes in and... They have a reason to stay home and other things happening and pretty soon people fall away from the faith. Could be for various reasons. Devil can put people to sleep. Amen? Amen. Now what gets Christians up and saying, you know, if I say, you're going to fall away from the faith, you say, I am not. I'm going to stand for Jesus. I love the Lord. I'm going to worship the Lord and stand for the Lord. You could ask me about that, and I would give my life for the Lord. Yeah, no problem. But would you? what happens if you're lulled to sleep in your spiritual life? That's a little more difficult to look at. So turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits, 
meaning things that are brought to our to us as if they're good but they're bad or as if they're true but they're false and teachings that come from demons Daniel warned us about the last days he says in Daniel 11:35 some of the wise will stumble. Isn't that, that's a huge statement in the last days. Some of the wise will stumble. I was encouraged some, somebody to, on Facebook, they encouraged him to read their Bible through. And, and one, I think, young pastor says, I'm done reading the old Jewish phone book, referring to the Old Testament. I'm done reading the old Jewish phone book. I said, brother, it'll be not too long before you're done reading the Christian new phone book as well. You know, when we adapt attitudes and things and say, you know what? I know this, I, I read the Bible through, I know what it's all about. And I, and I said, you know, if you stop growing, stop reading, stop seeking God, you're going to be going. That's simply the truth. But Daniel says that some of the wise will stumble. Doesn't that put a little fear of God in you? You're not exempt from the possibility of being deceived. That's why you have to be in solid relationship with Jesus every day in his word and prayer and worship, talking about the Lord, letting the Lord be the center of your life every day because uh, I'm with you. If I don't care about my relationship with Jesus, I'm going to be deceived in something that means that says I'm okay, you're okay with where I'm at when I might not be okay. But some of the wise will stumble. Am I speaking to you today? Amen. Hopefully. Yeah. Some of the wives will stumble so that they be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end. For it will still come at the appointed time. And this falling away in the last days, abandoning the faith, is such an important issue with Jesus and his teaching of the last days. You know, there are 100 chapters of the Bible that deal with the end times. 100. There are less than 10 chapters, tired chapters, that deal with any other one subject. But the end times gets 100 chapters. Say, okay, so... If the Bible gives 100 chapters to one subject, the end times, it must be important, right? Well, Jesus warned us about falling away in the last days and abandoning the faith. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, going through verse 12, I want you to listen to this. This is so important. For many will come in my name. Whose name? Not Buddha. Many will come as the Christ, as the Messiah, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And we see that throughout the last several decades, that people rise up and become a Christ in the second coming or some type of aspect of Christ and literally millions of people follow. You hear wars and rumors of wars, we get that, but see to it that you're not alarmed in your faith. We're talking about it really here. 
Such things must happen, <clears throat> but the end is still to come. We see things getting worse in our world. Mm -hmm. Don't be alarmed by that. It's supposed to be that way. Yeah. Not worse for you and me, but worse for the world. Amen. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of pains. Beginning. We're just getting warmed up. We're just getting started. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated of all nations because of me. If you love Jesus, they will hate you. If you love the Lord and stand for the Lord, you will get feedback and backlash for your stance for the Lord. Back when I got saved on April 2nd, 1968, at the start of the Jesus movement in Los Angeles, actually nationwide. It was a popular thing for the, for the first five, six, seven years that I was a Christian to be a Christian. You would hear it in all the rock and roll songs even, mentioning the Bible, mentioning Jesus, mentioning various things. And... Uh, you know, you'd hear things that almost were gospel songs in, in, in the, on the radio. Oh, Happy Day went to the number one chart, chart. A lot of things. So it was a good time to be a Christian. You were, it was a popular time, fun time. But that's not the day we live in. You stand for Jesus. You stand for morality. You stand for the things that are right, and you might be standing alone on the Word of God. Verse, time, verse 10, at that time, look at this, highlight this. At that time, many, uh, excuse me, many will turn away from the faith and will betray each other. At the, Jesus is warning us that it's going to be an exodus from the church, the body of Christ. What's to counter that? God's going to bring a revival and bring others. You know, when uh, there's all those who are invited to the wedding feast refuse to come for various reasons, God sent out the servants to the highways and the byways and begged them to come in. And when this house was filled, God will fill his house. God will have his people. But isn't it kind of a shame that many people have to fall away? Don't let your name be among those. Amen. Right? I think it's good for you to determine with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, with everything that's within you, I will not turn away from Jesus. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Be careful, watch your heart. Because the love of God within you can grow cold if you're neglected. Re Revelation chapter 2, the message to the Ephesian church. I have one thing against you. You have left your first love. Let's not leave our first love. Okay, because of increase of wickedness, 
the love of most will grow cold. Okay, back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We've got to find that, that the spiritual warfare be behind all this because it talks about deceptive spirits and teachings that are done by demons. So it's a spiritual conflict. We, we have to know that we are in a spiritual warfare, right? In the, the armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18, put on the full armor of God. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. That's our battle. And so there's war, because what backs all these things about people abandoning the faith is this. They're succumbing to the warfare and being defeated on the spiritual grounds that God says that we are to be ready for. Verse 2, these people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. Hypocrite playing the part, uh, saying things that are right, but actually meaning something else, deceiving. And actually having conscience that are seared. You know, if people neglect the Lord or even reject the Lord, it comes to a point where the, they don't want to repent. Their conscience is actually seared as if with a hot iron and they refuse to have anything to do with God. That's what happens with the two aspects of apostasy. One is a doctrinal apostasy saying, I'm done with Jesus, I'm converting to something else. I'm renouncing Jesus to do that. And you have to have a, and once you do that in a clear conscience, you, you seal that conscience so that you're not going to go back. And people have done that where they now, uh, I'll give you an example, a few years ago, I was sitting with a young man, in, and my car was getting uh, worked on at the auto shop, and I noticed his Muslim covering and all that. And, I, and he talked to me, and I said, excuse me, uh, are you, you're not from an Islamic country, are you? He says, no. I said, but you are Islamic, correct? Yes. I said, I'm very curious about this. What were you before you turned to Islam? He says, I was a Baptist. I was a Christian. I said, well, uh, I'm really curious about this, meaning that you had to renounce Jesus as a Christian and swear to the five pillars of Islam and become a Muslim. He says, that's right. That's what I did. I said, Jesus is not the Christ, not the Messiah. Christians are absolutely wrong. Absolutely. Said. Now that's called doctrinal apostasy. I, I don't know if Victor is with me, the, uh, this is not, but we were flying to Mexico City to do a pastor's conference, and seated next to me was this young woman, and she had these dots all over her hands and beads, and, and uh, as the plane was taken off, she was really intensely in prayer and counting her beads and f actually fearful, and she got in the air and I said, I noticed that you were counting beads, but 
it doesn't seem like this is a rosary. She says, no, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist Christian. I said, okay, uh, uh, okay. Uh, you're a Buddhist Christian, yes. And I said, so how long have you been studying Buddhism? Well, a couple of years. I said, you, you realize that you have to make either a choice for Jesus or a choice for Buddhism. And she says, that's exactly what my Buddhist priest told me last week. I have to make a choice. I said, so what brings you to Mexico City? She says, well, I have to go to Mexico City to tell my grandmother about my Buddhism, but I'm scared of that because she's a strong Christian. I said, well, is she a Catholic? Because, you know, Mexico. She says, no, she's not a Catholic. She's a strong evangelical Christian, and she knows God. And I said, and you're... I said, you should be worried about presenting your Buddhism to grandma, that type of thing. Okay, I found this on the web. Thank you, Siri. <laughs> so I, I said, well, let me pray for you. And I prayed about her grandma and all that. And we landed. The whole time we're going through customs to get the baggage and stuff, She's waving to me, thanking me. And I think, thank God. Maybe that was the witness that would be right in time for the final testimony with Grandma so, to turn her away from apostasy. Because you make that choice, and you abandon the faith, and you declare, I renounce Jesus and Christ with full conscience. The Bible says, you're in dangerous ground. Wow. Now, Paul's t talking in verse 3 about particular cults uh, and things that people abandoned the faith and some of the things that they did and per were persuaded of in their abandonment of the faith. And uh, verse 3 says, They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods. Well, one of the earliest cultic groups that I think Paul's referring to was the Essenes around the Dead Sea area that were uh, males only, celibate, and they had to take certain... Uh, vows and things to eliminate everybody on the outside. And they lived a strict communal life and actually was very cultic in their approach towards being separated unto God. And we know of others that have done that as well, using some of the things to attack the fundamentals of Christianity and doing something else. You know, I, I I believe that the new covenant and new grace, the grace of the new covenant is not for the dietary laws and mandates of the Judaism in the Old Testament. He says, wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Pastor Tom and I have been, were fed some food in Kenya, and we had to be gracious to eat what we didn't know was in there. But it says, since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanksgiving. So we pray. I tell you what, when you get into some countries, praying about your food is a big deal. I mean, today, praying about my double cheeseburger might not be that big a deal, you know. 
but, but, but if you're praying about something that's before you in a foreign country and you don't know what it is, I mean, you're, that's where it really comes up a lot. Receive it with thanksgiving. Also, we have eaten some things not to offend our gracious hosts. We drank some sambu porridge and embu porridge and kiryagan porridge and, and kukuyu porridge and things that just don't tell me what's in it. Let's thank God. <laughs> On the other hand, I've seen a pastor where going to a church in Nairobi and they fixed an elaborate meal for him and his guests and went out of their way and he refused to eat and sat in his car and would not fellowship with the people and would not participate and offended the whole congregation. Bible says, don't do that type of stuff. Amen. If you don't like BLTs, fine. I, and you know, you believe that if you eat a little bacon, you're going to hell. I don't, I don't care about that. <laughs> but don't hurt people and wound people and violate people's conscience. I'm not okay to say that, but I said it and you're, that's it. <laughs> For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God in prayer. One of the things about cults and culty teaching and things is that adding things to the scripture that makes it, if you do these things, you're more spiritual, you've, got, uh, you've been enlightened with revelation and isolation and man, man, making things mandatory. So what happens next? You get a revelation, and suddenly your revelation makes the pastor not so smart, kind of a dumb guy. He doesn't have the revelation I got on all these things. And since the pastor doesn't have the revelation that you do now, because you got all these things going on, now the church worship and the preaching is really, you know, really not up to snuff, so I'll go find a church that does. And after you find that none of the churches do, you go home and you start your own church in your own house because you're the one that's got the revelation and you're doing all these things right and everybody else is doing it wrong. And pretty soon after that, you find that nobody's following your little church, so you go off the hill. And then you're not satisfied after a while, and, and pretty soon you're gone. And pride and, and all sorts of deceiving things and teachings of demons lead down to those paths, and that's a sad thing. I hope I could, uh, wish I could demonstrate it a little differently and a little more clear, but if you got the picture, that's great. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, T Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching that you have have followed. Verse 7, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training in godliness is much better. Promising benefits in life, this life and the life to come. <clears throat> Verse 
This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Verse 9, 10. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle for our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, particularly of those of the believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learns them. One of the things that will keep you in the truth is being humble of heart, being teachable, nothing that, feed, that feeds the sense that you have a revelation that nobody else has. And in our humility, we, we come together, we hear the word of the Lord, we learn together, we grow together, we pray together. I think one of the things that, that the enemy does is uses his sense of pride and arrogance and tries to put that onto people, making them feel special about the things that they've learned and they know. And now that they become the new standard for which all others must line up to. That's wrong, right? Serve the Lord with all humility. Don't let deceiving spirits, things that are pro promoted by demons, deceive you in any way to abandon the faith. There's no one like Jesus Christ. Someone tried to tell me that we, that when we say the name of Jesus, that's not his name. I said, well, oh, brother. Yeah. Say Yeshua is his only name. You can't say Jesus Christ. Well, Yeshua is not in the New Testament. It's not even in the Old Testament. It's not in the Hebrew. It's not in the Greek. It's his Palestinian Aramaic name. And you think that it would be important for the apostles, but no, they put Jesus Christus, Jesus, Jesus Christos, in the New Greek New Testament and gave us the name of Jesus Christ so we can use it. Amen. We will use it. Don't tell me, nobody tell me I can't use the name of Jesus Christ because it's English. Ridiculous. In the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11. I, there's so much deception out there. It's like, oh yeah, I got a handle on this because I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows Hebrew. And they said to somebody, and somebody said to them, and they said to someone else and told me, <laughs> That we can't say the name of Jesus Christ anymore. We gotta go to heaven. Amen. Amen. Father God, keep these people in the word and in humble and keep us from evil and keep us from the deception in the world. Even the slightest deceptions that look on the surface as if it's okay, we profess the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.